thank you for joining. It's a small gathering, uh, and uh, it's a good opportunity because we have our good friend, uh, Dr. Martin Smith, who is uh, one of the biggest experts on creative economy in Britain, which means in the world, because uh, not too much uh, knowledge is uh, already collected in this uh, area in the world. And uh, we had a very interesting uh, interview last year uh, when Martin came, uh, which is on the which you can watch on Ololo YouTube. And uh, this time, Martin said that uh, he wants to continue that conversation and talk more about technology. And Martin was recently approached by the uh, British Parliament uh, to do to like to prepare his views on. Uh, how uh, Great Britain should uh, develop creative economy, how, uh, what technologies should be considered, first of all. And uh, he was you know, collecting information, and uh, we have this opportunity to listen to his presentation on the latest, latest cutting edge uh, technologies and uh, how they are integrated by uh, creative entrepreneurs in Great Britain and in the world, right? So we'll, uh, we'll, We'll watch the. We'll, we'll hear Martin's presentation and then we'll do questions and answers session. Yes, Martin. These are members of uh, our association from different areas: movies, IT startups, the longest uh, creative uh, tradition in Kyrgyzstan. So next time it will be the 18th time. So who is the jazz festival? The King is back. Yeah. Right. Very good. Yeah. I helped to, f to uh, start a jazz festival in the UK. It was called Love Supreme. <laughs> very successful. We sold it for a lot of money. <laughs> and Martin has a very interesting uh, background. Uh, so uh, usually when we talk about Martin here, we, say, uh, we speak about his uh, work in the Ingenious Group, which is one of the biggest uh, investors into creative economy in the world. Uh, around two billion pounds of investment has already been made in Great Britain. Uh, most of the money goes to movies, movie making, as I understand. And uh, among the movies we watched, uh, it's Life of Pi and uh, Avatar and uh, Australia and a lot of other movies. And uh, Martin is uh, is uh, is an advisor to this uh, organization, and he's participating in the investment decisions. So we can we can talk about the investment in movie making, how how it's how it's done, how decisions are made, etc. Apart 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 from that, he's a, he's a professor in the Goldsmith University, which is one of the main uh, uh, educational sites in creative economy in the world. Also, they are doing a lot of experiments with uh, educating creative entrepreneurs which is not easy, uh, which, is, which is a new thing, and uh, Martin will tell maybe why. But before that, Martin spent uh, uh, some time in Russia doing uh, PR consulting, and, uh, and, if, if we are, and if we have very good conversation, very deep conversation, maybe Martin will tell a great story about, uh, about his Russian adventures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, for us in association, uh, Martin is Ökulata. I don't need to explain what Ökulata means. Uh, so he is. Uh, he blessed us uh, last year when we just uh, started, when we just uh, registered our association, our first press conference of the association, when we were showing the certificate of registration, Martin was there, he was congratulating us, he was uh, uh, giving us <coughs> his advice. And uh, Martin is growing, it's alive, it's, uh, it, it works, and the law is already here. So I hope we'll do even more with your help. Thank you for coming, thank you for advising us, and thank you for being ready to share your knowledge. Uh, well, Daniel, first of all, thank you very much for that very um, generous introduction. And um, first of all, I apologize, I'm not wearing a jacket. <laughs> so most English gentlemen are supposed to wear jackets, but it's, it's nice and warm, so I, I've taken my jacket off. 
please forgive me. Um, and let me say, first of all, uh, congratulations to all of you for the successful founding of the association. I mean, that has largely happened since I was here. I mean, I was last here in October, 11 months ago. Um, and I do think that it is an amazing achievement to have um, created this organization and to have attracted so many different members from different parts of the creative sector. And I, I congratulate all of you uh, on that achievement. I think it really is remarkable. And I, I can't think of um, any other country which has um, seen the beginning and the growth of a trade association like this um, so successfully in such a short time. So let me try to explain uh, what I will try to do in the next um, half an hour or so. And it, it, it's kind of an experiment. Um, as Daniel said, um, we had this very, very enjoyable conversation last October, which, is, which you will see it on Alolo Talks. By the way, if you look at this video on YouTube, you will see two or three interesting things. One is that this interview begins in the daylight. Yeah. And when it finishes, it's completely dark. <laughs> Uh, which tells you that we talked for a very long time and because the, the subject matter was so interesting. Um, and then the second thing you will notice is that um, we talked for so long that um, many trains went yes. backwards and forwards. <laughs> and so, um, so it was, it was great fun. Uh, it was very enjoyable to have this conversation with Dan. And um, it was, as he says, as a consequence of that conversation that I thought to myself that even though we talked about many, many subjects and we referred in passing to the issue, broader issues of technology, we didn't really analyze the, any of the kind of relationships um, between culture and technology. And I thought it would be interesting um, if I give you some of my thoughts about this subject matter. And a lot of what I have to say is really in the form of questions. You know, I, I am not here to give you the right answers to all of these questions. Uh, what I want to do really is to share some of my questions and thoughts about how this relationship the relationship between art and commerce and culture and technology um, is changing, and uh, what the significance of these changes are for the creative economy. So um, I start with a, a fairly simple but fundamentally important point, which is that in the cultural economy, creative economy, there are many different players. There are many different uh, uh, parties. And they have different motivations. I think it's important to recognize that motivations are different depending on what you are doing. So um, at the top, I mean, the most important 
party in all of this is the artist. And by the artist, I mean the, the, the filmmaker or uh, um, the, the uh, musician, the cultural producer, um, the publisher, the writer. Of course, her motivation or his motivation, above all, is to communicate, is to communicate with uh, an audience and to express certain kind of creative feelings or ideas. Um, that's a very different motivation from the motivation of an entrepreneur in the usual sense of that term. The entrepreneur generally seeks to profit from, I mean, literally to make a profit from um, technological change or changes in regulation. So her motivation is to make money. And then you have increasingly, as we all know, these huge, powerful American and Chinese organizations. It, it, by the way, in London, increasingly, we call them GAFAT. <laughs> it's not the GAFAT, we call them, standing for Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, um, and other platforms. And their motivations are different again. I mean, essentially, their motivations are about getting more data on you, on every one of you, every one of us. We are the product for those companies. They want more data about us. Why do they want more data? Because they want to sell us more stuff or they want their clients to be able to sell us more stuff. Um, and so they have a motivation which is wholly profit-driven. And then you have regulators. I don't think we need to talk too much about that. Regulators are much more important uh, in the developed economies. But their job, their motivation, is to strike a balance between different competing interests in the creative economy. So this is the first point is really just to emphasize that we are dealing with um, quite different motivations. And I think it's important to recognize that. And um, then we move on to um, thinking about the changing relationship between arts and culture um, what we used to call the entertainment industries. But still in America, the dominant language is entertainment industry. Um, and what is usually called information and communications technology. So this is where the creative economy comes from. The notion of the creative economy comes from um, the, as I described it in my interview with, uh, with Danya, uh, the intermingling of the engagement between art and business and commerce and technology. And if we think about these relationships in a, an economic sense, we examine them from the point of view of the economist. Um, what is it? What is the value that is being created in these businesses? And this, of course, is what helps to define the sector. The classic definition of creative industries is to do with the creation of intellectual property. And intellectual property is still the defining characteristic of most um, creative industries. It's the writing of the book, it's the making of the film, it's the writing of the song, it's the invention of the game, um, it's the ownership of the rights in that creation, and then the licensing of those rights, and then possibly the sale of those rights. That is the nature of the value which is created by the sector. Um, so we, we are still very much in a world in which 
um, uh, the value of what we do in the marketplace is defined by the intellectual property we create. And the problem is that that was changed in a very, very fundamental way by the development of the internet. And of course, you all know this, but it's important that we recognize what has been happening. Because the thing about the internet, above all else, is that it is a vast, great copying machine. That's what it is. It enables people to copy enormous amounts of stuff. Um, books, newspapers, art, music, you name it. And that changed a lot of the economics of the creative sector and is still changing. And I have to say that some of the um, consequences for people like the company I work for, Ingenious Media, have been wholly negative. Why do I say that? Because, because the internet is a great copying machine, it enables bad actors and what we call pirates, intellectual, the, the people who steal intellectual property, um, it enables them to steal movies, for example, in huge quantities. I mean, there, there are um, now in China, for example, there are companies which just steal movies and they make them available to users um, through websites. And they look, some of these websites look like Western streaming streaming services. They look like, uh, they look like uh, um, Disney Plus or Netflix. Um, I have to tell you that um, the, the damage created to businesses like ours is huge. I mean, last year alone, we think we lost something like $100 million US because of the, the um, operation of these pirate sites. So um, it, this is just by way of saying that you know, the, the impact of the internet is not always benign. It's not always positive. Of course, it is also positive in, in all sorts of ways, which we will come back to. And there are, uh, there are other examples um, uh, which we become increasingly familiar with of the interaction of the latest technology with the creation of art or the ownership of art in the broadest sense, um, where um, entirely new questions are uh, being posed. And one example which I've mentioned here, I mean, I think, Daniel, you mentioned this in our first interview. Everybody's now heard of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which is a, a technology developed, it's called blockchain. You probably know about it. Um, and this, the, latest, the latest scandal to take place um, is that there are companies now creating NFTs based on the artwork of uh, other creators, of artists, of sculptors. And on the internet, they are selling these tokens and they have not even got the permission of the artist to use that um, image or that token which is, which is being traded on a market. And um, one particular example, there, some of you may have heard of a, a great um, sculptor, British sculptor. Uh, he's, he is British, but he has an Indian name. He's called Anish Kapoor. Anish Kapoor is probably the most famous artist in the UK. And he discovered about six months ago that there were all these NFTs 
being traded on the market of his work. <laughs> and, and nobody had asked him whether he agreed to this. You know. So what that has led to is um, all kinds of disputes. And these disputes will get bigger. And there will be a lot of work for lawyers who specialize in intellectual property. So you know, we begin to understand that the, you know, the, the relationship um, between, uh, between the core process of the creation of art, the creation of value in art, and its interaction with, with technology um, it is changing our world. It's changing our world, and it's, it's posing newer and newer questions. I'll give you another example, which is very recent. Maybe you even heard of it uh, uh, yourselves. Uh, three weeks ago, I heard of a new computer program, inevitably in California. All these things start in California. So there is a new computer program based on the ideas and uh, the technology of AI, artificial intelligence, machine reading capability. And so there is now this new program in California. And what did they do? They took the work of one new artist, just one picture. And with this computer program, they created 20 new paintings based on the uh, analysis of just this one first picture, but identifying correctly the particular characteristics of this artist, you know, the stylistic characteristics, the, the artistic uh, distinguishing characteristics, but generating pictures. Um, and if you think about this, you think, wow. <laughs> so I'm a new artist. I've painted one picture. Now I can go and sit on the beach for the rest of my life because I've got this computer program and it will do the painting for me. You know? I mean, just think about that in terms of its uh, uh, consequences for... Uh, anyway, so these are examples of, of, of the kind of world we're living in. Now, let me, let me then move to a, 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 different, a different kind of set of questions altogether. And, and I think these are uh, probably uh, less important here than they may be in, in more developed creative economies, I don't know, but you will certainly recognize uh, some of the things I refer to. The rising generation of young people, certainly in our country, in the UK and in most of Europe, are consuming culture in a wholly different way from earlier generations. The change is very remarkable. I mean, I've just given uh, uh, a couple of examples here, uh, we have research which shows that kids uh, of 20 or younger, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old kids, no longer watch broadcast television. They don't watch any broadcast television. They don't watch the BBC. They don't watch ITV. Everything they watch um, is derived from either YouTube or TikTok. No. Uh, we have, um, uh, uh, this is not just an empty um, claim that I'm making. We have an organization in the UK called Ofcom. Uh, Ofcom is our regulator for the media sector. And they collect data about what people are watching and how, pe how they're watching it. And the change has been incredibly fast, incredibly fast. So you have a young generation of uh, consumers who are actually digest, are actually consuming news, news and music um, solely from YouTube, TikTok, or Spotify. 
Just think about that, what means for the consumption of culture in the years that have come. And then there are other things that are, are um, changing. Um, as I say here, you know, very few people who go to theater and opera and classical music and museums, fewer and fewer of those people are under the age of 50. And most of the people who go to museums in particular, but also opera and also theater on, in, in, in the UK are now over the age of 50. And um, that means that there are enormous problems coming down the road for these kind of traditional cultural organizations. They have to find new ways of appealing to young people, otherwise they will die. Now, here we come to another point, and, um, and Daniel, I mean, we, you, we haven't really discussed this, um, and this is a difficult subject. Um, the pandemic in our country has had a devastating impact on much of the creative sector. I mean, it, I can hardly exaggerate. We lost 400,000 jobs in the creative sector during the pandemic. This is because theaters were closed, music uh, venues were closed, cinemas were closed, museums were closed, not once, but not twice, but three times. And uh, the cost of keeping those uh, institutions uh, from going bankrupt was enormous. So the state made these very big payments, 1.57 billion pounds. But it was to keep the institutions from going bankrupt. And a lot of the people who worked in those organizations left. And they haven't come back. Um, so, the impact of the pandemic on, on consumption um, has been enormous. I, I don't know what the, I'd be really interested to know uh, from the festivals guys, you know, what the impact here has been. But I mean, I can tell you, for example, we have an enormous uh, uh, music festival scene, as you know. Glastonbury is only the most famous. Um, this year, the number of people attending music festivals was 20% less than 2019. So, you know, so we're nowhere near getting back to the world before the pandemic. And I was just talking uh, earlier in relation to the film business, which is our business. The impact of the pandemic on the film industry has been catastrophic. I mean, it's almost catastrophic. Um, the, the biggest chain of cinemas in the United States has gone bankrupt, right? Regal Cinemas has actually gone into uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Why is this? Because people are not coming back to the cinema in the way. And um, I can tell you that it's not, the, it's, not equal, it's not the same in all countries, but in the UK we are now talking about um, an audience of 75% of, of, of the audience before the pandemic. In Italy, only 55% of people who went to the cinema before the pandemic are now going. So there is, there is a fear of uh, congregating in public places for cultural events. Um, so th these are also uh, um, matters that we, uh, we have to consider. And then the, the, there are changes in, uh, uh, in the nature of different media products. Um, innovate, the pace of innovation continues to quicken Things are moving faster and faster. Um, business models are changing all the time. So for example, many of you will have heard of Fortnite, which is this hugely popular uh, video game, uh, in which you can now see a 
a pop concert, you could see a music uh, concert within a game, which changes the business model of that. Um, now, I mean, here is the uh, here is the the, the the real challenge, I think, um, that we begin to see, um, and it, it emerges from what I call the mantra of Silicon Valley. Now, let me try and explain what I mean by the mantra of Silicon Valley. So this is the kind of philosophy of the platforms of, of Amazon. Uh, by the way, before I continue, it e it's easy to forget how new these internet platforms are. You know. um, Amazon was founded in 1994. TikTok, uh, as a uh, medium for global distribution of content to the English-speaking world, was only introduced five years ago in 2017. Facebook was started in 2006. So within the last generation, this world has, has changed dramatically. But what they say, what all these people say is, and I've kind of highlighted it, Everyone can be a creator. That is what they say. If you are a songwriter, you're a poet, you're a playwright, you're a filmmaker, everybody can do it. It's simple. You make it, you get yourself a website, and you put your work up there, and everybody can sell the stuff. And it's a very appealing idea. There's only one problem with it, which is that if you can do that, I can also do it, and everybody else in the room can do it, and it means the market becomes more and more full of people who think they can be an artist. So, for example, maybe I want to be a hip-hop artist, you know. I may not look like a hip hop artist, but you know, I may decide I want to be a hip hop artist. Do you know how many hip hop art artists there are in the United States on YouTube? Has anybody any idea? But the, the answer is 100,000. <laughs> 100,000. So if I want to become a hip hop artist, I become 100,001, right? And I have to compete against all these other people. They all have their own websites. <laughs> They're all putting their videos. So, so it's an increasingly competitive world. Uh, and that is you know, uh, one of the most fundamental um, uh, aspects of the way in which our world is changing. Um, now. Um, let, I mean, let me just um, continue with uh, uh, an extension of some of these thoughts. Where are we? Where is it all going? Can we see the future? And this is where you know um, I'm really interested to know your thoughts around the room uh, and your your ideas about some of these questions because technology develops ever more quickly. So we have this thing called augmented reality, uh, and then we have virtual reality. What, what do we mean by virtual reality? Actually, nobody entirely agrees what virtual reality is, but this is more or less the definition that uh, most people uh, ha have accepted. A simulated experience that can be similar to or completely different from the real world. And um, I think this is quite interesting to think about from a creative point of view, because um, there, are, there is no doubt that there are many applications of VR which uh, are already brilliantly successful. You know? uh, one, one example is, is in the world of medical pedagogy teaching. People are now learning how to do quadruple heart operations 
by using virtual reality technology. So it is changing the world of medical education in a way which is fantastic and, uh, 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 and very exciting. But actually, when you look at the possible applications of VR to our world, to the, the creative world, it, it's much more difficult, I think, to be certain that these things um, are going to be attractive to audiences. But there is a lot of experimentation taking place. There's a huge amount of money being invested in, in the UK into virtual reality. Um, and of course, as I uh, have suggested here, um, the biggest, actually the biggest investor in virtual reality is Facebook. And Facebook is so invested in all this stuff that it has changed its name. It now calls itself Meta, because Facebook thinks that the future of the creative world will be the metaverse. Uh, I mean, I really love to know your view on, on this later on, Dan. And I, I, have to, uh, I have to confess to all of you that I don't really understand what the attraction of this, this idea of living as an avatar of myself, engaging with all you guys through your avatars of yourself. I mean, I, I understand the kind of concept, but um, is it actually going to really appeal to anybody at all? I don't know. Um, but it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's an area where technology companies are making enormous bets. I mean, billions and billions of dollars. And they think they can persuade uh, all of us that we will, in future, want to consume creative outputs via the metaverse. I, I just don't know, but I'd love to, uh, I'd, I'd love to um, uh, get your views on this. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk for too long. I, th there are some more examples here of the way in which technology is changing the balance of, of all kinds of power relations. Um, and, um, uh, and also relationships, I think, between different parts of the global creative economy. I mean, I want to spend just a minute on one example because I think it's interesting. Um, the fastest growing power in the global creative economy in the last 15 years has been South Korea. The South Korea has transformed itself extraordinarily into a powerhouse of, of creativity. And um, just the most, uh, I mean, just the, the best known example, uh, the, the director of Bong Joon-ho's um, film, Parasite, won the Oscar for best film. And that is the first time the Oscar for best film has ever been won by a non-English speaking uh, filmmaker and producer. And it's an incredibly interesting symbol of how um, a culture which is kind of uh, new to most of the world uh, can um, become attractive and develop a market uh, in a way which has real consequences for the global creative economy. It's not just in film, by the way. If you go to London, um, if you go to London right now, you will see an exhibition of South Korean art at the Victoria and Albert Museum. You will see South, you will see South Korean ballet for the first time in London. Um, we all know about K-pop. I mean, K-pop has kind of taken over the world. So um, it's, it's extraordinary how many dimensions of South Korean culture are now really valuable uh, um, and have become popular. And I mention all of this because technology has driven a lot of this change because South Korea is the most advanced country 
in terms of connectivity, the power of its IT capability, the speed of its connectivity. It can transmit its cultural products via the internet. This is, of course, where the internet has a positive consequence. Um, and I would say that the, the internet has made possible, or technology has made possible, the um, uh, discovery by most of the world of uh, a, a, new, a, a new kind of cultural powerhouse. And it may just be that there are opportunities for other countries in the global creative economy to do similar things. Now, uh, um, I, I'm going to say just a little bit about, um, uh, as usual, I have too much to say. But I, I mean, I want to mention, um, before I begin to wind up, um, this book. I don't know whether any of you, have anybody, has anybody heard of this book called The Death of the Artist? So this came out about three years ago. And it's a book by an American. Of course, all these, uh, nearly all these foundational texts come out of the USA. This man called William Derizowicz. He's American. It's a Polish name, but he's American. He's a writer, essayist. And he writes this book called The Death of the Artist. And, um, of course, his title is intended to be provocative. He's not actually talking about the death of the artist. What he's doing is he's showing how the role of the artist has changed over a period of a thousand years. So he tracks the change from the role of the artist as, uh, as an artisan and a craftsperson in the medieval period in the European context. So even great classical composers like Johann Sebastian Bach regarded themselves as craftspeople above all else. You know, they were makers of things. And they, th the role of the artist changes at the end of the medieval period and into the 19th century, the artist become, has a different identity and he becomes or she becomes more uh, uh, of the, the genius type, right? The, uh, the artist in a, uh, uh, in a garret somewhere, the struggling artist, but who is the genius, the composer, the playwright, the poet, and the idea of who an artist is changes. And then he goes on and he tracks it through. In the 20th century, he says the, 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 uh, the role of the artist changes again, and art people become professionals. You know? They are paid, they're employed, they're commissioned, and they get salaries, and they get teaching jobs. And then he says, you know, in the 21st century, it changes again, and the artist becomes the entrepreneur, right? So what, what, what Derizovitz does in this book is that he analyzes the changing identity and role within society of people who are making art, from craftsman to genius to professional to entrepreneur. And um, it's worth looking at that book because what he does is he talks to about 200 different artists and he talks to journalists, he talks to uh, painters, he talks to dancers, he talks to craftspeople, and um, he examines how the internet and technology has changed their lives, and how these uh, men and women are now obliged to work in a different way from the way they were 20 years ago. Um, and for example, how they use um, 
websites like Patreon. Does everybody know what Patreon is here? Uh, it's uh, crowdfunding mechanisms to pay for their work to get um, uh, customers. And, and how you know, working on Patreon has become more and more and more and more difficult because everybody can be an artist and everybody's trying to do it. So it's a very challenging book. And um, I'm going to come to the last page now. So if you think about all of these issues, um, you, you have to ask yourself um, a, a question about, well, where is this all going? That's, that's the question I'm posing at the top. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the future? And this is the kind of point that I really want to come to because um, my, my responses to that question um, are, I think I would say, work in progress. I mean, I'm still trying to think it through. First of all, the complexity of this stuff is huge. It's really, really difficult stuff. But second, and I think this is probably the most important point uh, and uh, for uh, Bishkek and for creatives in, not just in Kyrgyzstan, but at the whole of Central Asia, by the way, I think the implications of all of these big changes are very different depending where you are. I think the implications are much more difficult for older economies, for the developed economies, for the USA, for Europe. Um, and I think the implications are completely different for countries like this, which are, relatively speaking, at the beginning of a journey. What? Nothing is always possible. Uh, they, it, it, at an early stage of development, at an early stage of market development. In other words, you haven't already got one million hip hop acts. You know, I'm sure you've got plenty, some hip hop acts, very good hip hop acts. But I think it's the largest and the oldest markets that face the biggest challenges. But then the other thing, um, which we have to retain sight of, and it's right to retain sight of, is that the global market, we talked about this in our first interview, the global market for cultural goods and services continues to grow every year, relentlessly. It is the most rapidly expanding market in the world. And it has been since about 2000. I think, did, I, did, we, did we talk about this? This was the work that, um, that UNCTAD, the United Nations Agency did, which showed that between 2002 and 2011, the global market for cultural goods and services grew at 8% every year, 8% every year. And that happened even during the global financial crash of 2008, when the economy contracted by 5%. So the global market went backwards by 5%, but all the way through this period, the market for cultural goods and services expanded. So I see that as being grounds for optimism on a, on a big scale, and particularly for parts of the world like this when uh, um, the market um, is, is growing. So uh, I'm going to stop there, I think, Dan. I think um, by the right collective mindset, um, I'm referring to uh, an attitude which is probably a cultural attitude more than anything else, which is what has worked in the past will not work in the future. That's a very simple formulation, but it's a very profound idea because in older economies, more developed economies, cultural economies, including 
cultural economies like the British cultural economy, because we have had so much success, there is a kind of tendency to think what has worked before will work for us again. And there is a kind of tendency to um, rest on our laurels. Do you know what I mean by that? There's a, there's a tendency to think we're good at this stuff. We have been successful at this stuff. Therefore, we will always be successful at this stuff. And I do not believe that is true. I do not believe that is true. In the same way that South Korea can completely transform itself as an economy and, and uh, as a, an influence on the global stage, then it's possible for countries which have been successful to go backwards. But so the right collective mindset, the straight answer to your question is the ability to understand that you need constantly to move forward um, in order to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. That means renewal all the time, new skills all the time. And I think what I'm trying to suggest is that I think that may be easier as an attitude to adopt here, uh, where, tell me if I've got this wrong, that, that, and actually this is the point of, of, of um, uh, the creative part law itself, isn't it? It is to recognize, to understand, to acknowledge that there is a part of the economy here in which something very interesting is happening very positive is happening, and it is time for the country to acknowledge it. That's, the, that's, what, that's what the creative part does, law does. Well, it does two things. First of all, it acknowledges, it recognizes that this is happening. And secondly, it says um, we must enable resources to be committed to it. But, but the, the, the CPL is itself an expression of something new. Yeah. And uh, for a country like the UK or France or Germany, you know, where they have been doing cultural stuff for centuries, it's much harder to, to have that attitude. D does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. So I, I just want to give one like yeah. framework that uh, we were just discussing with the right. uh, with the <laughs> today. You know, uh, there is this uh, famous uh, paradox of Zeno uh, about the Achilles and uh, the and the turtle. Well, what's happening? Okay. So he says that uh, if there is an, a person who is uh, trying to catch the turtle. Yeah. So which one is me? <laughs> Not telling. <laughs> Yeah, the spectator. So he says, uh, for example, this person he can uh, he can move ten times faster than the turtle. Yeah. So it should be easy for him to catch the turtle. However, while he passes this distance, the turtle passes this distance, like yeah. ten times shorter. When uh, he is uh, passing this distance, the turtle moves this distance. Yeah. So the Z Zenon is saying that you can follow this turtle like forever, but you will never catch it because, because yes, you're moving much faster, but it, it is moving uh, anyway. Yeah. So he says it's a paradox. We all understand that uh, you would be able to catch the turtle, yeah. but uh, thinking with this logic, you will never do. And then uh, the solution to this is that, you know, when, uh, when we try to catch the turtle, we should not uh, try to catch the turtle itself. We, we should think, where the turtle is moving, and we should count how we can reach there. So as for the, uh, well, about the topic that you, you raised here, I think it's extremely important, especially for us, and I completely agree about the mindset. Because the mindset that we have here in Kyrgyzstan is that we see this uh, developed world, and we always try to catch it. We try to reproduce what the developed world has achieved. We try to, to, to do the ballet, we try to do movies, we try to use these templates, 
And uh, we are never good enough in this. We will never be able to produce one more Tesla car. We will never be able to produce one more iPhone. Because we will spend hundreds of years to produce the current iPhone, but by that time the iPhone will produce <laughs> something else, right? So instead of that, if we think of uh, where the world is moving, and if we move exactly there, if we know the world is, uh, is, uh, yeah. is, uh, is moving towards creative economy, more and more <coughs> people are engaging, and uh, all of these things, uh, we can include them here, augmented reality, VR, yeah. blockchain, yeah. all of these uh, things are so important. And so many people in the developed countries don't understand these technologies because you have quite a good life without these technologies as well. This is an opportunity for a country like us yeah. because instead of becoming an architect, we could become an architect in the metaverse, mm -hmm. building houses in metaverse. Instead of becoming fashion designer, we could become fashion designers in the metaverse, creating virtual dresses. We could sell them for bigger money yeah. And there is much less competition in these areas because the world is still in the traditional economy, yeah. in the traditional movie making. And I was still telling to Erke that I think uh, we will never be able to, be, uh, to become competitive in the movie world, in the, in, the, in the movie market. But if we understand that there are new types of movies, like movies in the virtual reality, for example. Maybe we should move in that direction, and we could become one of the first countries, one of the first producers of VR movies, for example, which is not happening everywhere. Yep, all the countries are <coughs> producing the yeah. 3D movies and all that. So let's not do that. Let's do something that they will start doing yeah. soon. So thank you. I think it's a very important... Uh, Can I just respond to, before we... Uh, yeah, sure, just, just to that point. Um, I, I completely understand the logic of, of, of what, what you're saying. The, I think the difficulty with it, um, as far as the creative sector is concerned, is to be sure that going here is actually where the world will be in 20 or 30 years' time. Now, let me give you a very concrete example. Because, you see, you've just, you just talked about, I really hope we can have this discussion. Um, because I personally don't understand why anybody would want to watch a movie in the metaverse. I mean, I just don't get it. I don't understand. That may be because I'm 140 years old, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I, the, I didn't know that. At, 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 you know, I mean, I look pretty good for my age, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm 140 years old. And I, I just cannot get my head around. Now, that is not just about me, by the way. Let me give you, because you just mentioned the example of 3D movie making. When was the first 3D movie made? Can you, do you know? Well, I think early 2000. 1922. Really? 1922. The Power of Love. 100 was, years ago. Yeah, th in 1922 okay. was the first 3D movies. This is not a new technology. So, uh, as you know, you were kind enough to mention it. Um, my company was very fortunate to be 30% financier of Avatar, which is the world's biggest selling film. <laughs> it's a 3D movie. Um, the Life of Pi was filmed in 3D and non-3D. So it was a 3D film. But here's the point. The world of cinema goers has never fallen in love with 3D. There is a reason why most films now made are 2D films, because people feel more comfortable cognitively with this. So now, I don't say, Daniel, therefore, <laughs> that VR films can't happen, but I do caution against the assumption that the latest technology can be married with all cultural forms successfully. Because in the case of 3D, <laughs> cinema goers have clearly said, we don't like it. We don't like wearing headsets you know, to watch a film. So um, the logic is clear and very understandable to me 
but you then have to be sure you're heading to uh, be world leading in a technology that isn't going to be redundant or rejected. You know? and that's where the problem is, it seems to me. Anyway, is anybody looking, is anybody looking to work in the metaverse? <laughs> So uh, thank you for your um, presentation. It was very interesting in uh, many uh, like points of view. And as as a father of a ten years old son, yes, uh, he's uh, very interested in uh, like you said. Uh, he's getting a lot of information from TikTok and YouTube, YouTube, yes. YouTube uh, channels. Yeah, and he wants to be a YouTube blogger yes so i was a bit worried mm. but uh, then i realized that there is a creative economy yeah. from then and then i'm i'm okay now yeah. so, uh, <laughs> also he realized that there is a, a big competition uh, between uh, among bloggers and uh, he first saw russian bloggers but then like 100 times bigger english uh, yes. bloggers yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, you realize that it's, it's going to be a big competition. So can you uh, tell me, like, can, can you give me some uh, probably uh, advice? It, uh, can you advise me to how to help him promote his uh, willing to be a blogger and how to, to uh, win this challenge among this big in this big competition of bloggers, and uh, because this is a creative economy, right? But I was hoping that you could tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I know that this is a, a, a let's step back a bit. I mean, the, the, what we call the creative economy it, it comprises so many different activities. So it's you know, opera singers to um, graphic artists, visual artists theatre directors, uh, um, video games makers, architects. Um, I am I'm quite knowledgeable about many of these forms, but not all of them. And one of the areas which I find hardest to understand, actually from a commercial point of view, is, this, is, is the blogosphere. I don't understand, I mean, it, I, I understand perfectly well the, the fact that many people blog you know, I do myself occasionally for the university, right? Um, but nobody's going to get rich doing that kind of thing. You know, the, I, the people who read my blogs, you know, are students, um, postgraduates, maybe people who were at the university, but nobody's making any money out of that. But there are people who make money, as you rightly say, and there are some people who make lots of money. And here we um, proceed into a world which I think is interesting, but also quite disturbing. Because um, some of the people who make the most money blogging are fashion bloggers, for example. And what they're actually doing is blogging um, and endorsing products, designs, clothes, shoes, whatever, and they're being paid to do that. They're being paid large sums of money by clothes companies or shoe companies or whatever. Now, in the pre-internet world, that was called advertising. <laughs> and there were regulations which governed that activity and, and still are, by the way, for the analog world, if, if in my country or in the United States, if you promote um, uh, the clothes of Prada, you know, if you're going <laughs> to... Prada's quite expensive, but anyway, if you promote prom, uh, clothes by, by Prada, you have to declare that that is what you are doing, and that's a regulated activity. There are rules about it. But if you blog on the internet and you know you're talking about fashion in general and 
you know, great new clothes coming from Milan or whatever it is, and then you say, but, and this dress from Prada is fantastic. Uh, you are not regulated in the same way as you are in the analog world. Uh, you do not have to declare that you're being paid. And, and lots of people, uh, th this is the world of what is called, in the, in the English word for it, on um, social media, is influencers. You know? uh, it's the world of Kim Kardashian and, uh, and all of these people. Uh, and we know they made large amounts of money promoting goods. And, and um, so, you know, part of the answer to, to your question, I think, is I, I, I wouldn't worry about them not being able to m make money. I mean, if they know what they're doing, what I worry about is the ethics of some of this activity, where, where there is concealed commercial payment uh, that is, it, it's an activity which is outside the scope of regulation and can be misleading to customers, consumers. But that's only one form of blogging. I mean, I just want to pick up on a, it's a slightly different point, but you mentioned YouTube. So there is a, there's another point that I want to make about YouTube, which is, which is relevant to entrepreneurship and the creative economy, which is that I have begun to understand myself only in the last couple of years how incredible YouTube is as a platform for starting a business. I mean, you can in the UK, I don't know whether you can do it here, you can set up a business, uh, put up create your own website, you know, go onto YouTube and sell you know, paintings, for example, you can sell your artwork, um, or you can sell your, um, uh, your pottery, uh, your ceramics, or whatever it is, or you can sell your services, um, your consultancy services, or whatever, uh, and you can make serious amounts of money on YouTube. I mean, I know of people who earn more than £100,000 a year from businesses on YouTube. That's happened really very, very quickly. I mean, I've only begun to understand this myself in the last couple of years. Can you do that here? Yes. I'm sure you must have members in, in Ololo. In your, um, who, who sell um, various products or services. And it's hard to sell products, yes. but uh, it's yeah. uh, easy to produce uh, <coughs> contents yeah. because it's much cheaper to produce content yes. here. Uh, so we have some, for example, uh, uh, YouTube channels for kids that are extremely successful. Number five in the world among the kids' yeah. channels. Uh, they, are from, they are here and based in Kyrgyzstan. <coughs> uh, they don't sell goods, though. They just... You know, uh, they just earn on, uh, you know, on the number of views on YouTube currently. But they are going to start their own merchandise. Yeah. They're quite famous. I was just showing yeah. our YouTube and uh, yeah. Anish Kapoor. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we can, uh, uh, the billions. These guys, uh, they are from Kyrgyzstan. And uh, this, for example, was watched... Uh, 2.5, almost uh, two and a half billion times. Right. And uh, this has become quite viral. Uh, but what's the revenue model here? YouTube pays for the views. Uh, for the kids, it doesn't allow to show advertisements. But in the future, uh, because they are now famous, they can produce merchandise. They can sell this kind of T-shirts. Right, so and, it, yes. Yeah, uh, so that, that's what they are planning. And also they are planning to, to create a video game. Yeah. based on these characters. But this is almost like a visual equivalent of blogging, in, in a way. I mean, it, if, you, if you're promoting merchandise, for example, on here, um, that is, that's actually advertising, but it's not regulated. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I did it. Yeah. Yeah, then we have another question here. Yeah, yes. Um, 
I've never thought about it as in out in that sense. I mean, what I un understand you to be saying is that it's essential to have your own voice, distinctive voice, authentic voice, something which is different, has a different story. And I can only agree with you. I mean, let me just try to illustrate why I think this is, is important. Um, I mentioned a little earlier um, that um, the pandemic has had a very negative impact on the film industry. Um, and I mentioned the fact that fewer people are going to the cinemas. Um, I really worry about the effect of all of this on the telling of stories uh, and which stories become actually made as films. If you look at the global box office figures for 2022, um, the biggest selling movie by far is Top Gun Maverick, right? That, that is, that's half as big again as the next biggest film. So it's yet another franchise, which is we've seen before. You know, Top Gun is an old franchise. And then, have you seen this film, um, Minions? Yeah. Minions, a Return of Gru, which is part of the Despicable Me franchise. Minions is the fourth biggest gross of office boxing film this year, and it's part of. And, you know, I, it, I find it really depressing that, that, <laughs> that, that, you know, the same kind of stuff is being pumped out. But this is what is selling. I mean, the, the, I, mean I mentioned, um, and I think we were having this conversation, I mentioned the fact that, that the biggest cinema chain in, in the USA has gone bankrupt, right? Regal Cinemas went bankrupt. It's in Chapter 11. That's how bad the problem in the film industry is. And the only film in, in May, June of this year that people went out to see was Top Gun Maverick. I mean, it was in all over the world. It was the same. And you can be sure if it had not been for Top Gun Maverick, more cinemas would have gone bankrupt. I mean, in, in the UK. Really? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is really bad news for kind of uh, diversity of creative expression. And so, uh, now, of course, this does not mean that um, other much more interesting films are not being made. You know, we're financing some ourselves. Um, and um, uh, and I won't speak about, about those films, but all I can say is that we, at the moment, are really worried about whether we can find an audience for some of the films that we are now making because uh, the, the, the appetite in advanced or you know, developed economies, for, in particular for drama, seems to be diminishing. Um, and because of this, I mean... Um, I have to be careful what I say because you're filming all of this stuff. But, I mean, it's not good news for us as a business at Ingenious. We are finding it very difficult to raise money because, because people say, well, cinema has no future. <laughs> so, now, I don't think that's true. I don't believe it's true. But I think the world of film is going to change fairly dramatically, I think there may well be fewer cinemas, and I think the cinemas will be different. They will be smaller. They will be multifunctional spaces, you know, places where maybe there are 50, 60 seats, not 500 or 600, and you do a range of other things within, you go and have coffee, or maybe you go to a yoga class, or you do other things. But I, I think that... that um, uh, and, and, you know, the theme of this is the impact of technology. What is causing this change? 
It is not just the pandemic. The pandemic is, has had the effect of accelerating changes which were already there. So the effect of the streamers, you know, the Amazons, the uh, Disney Pluses, Netflixes, that had already started to eat away at the audience for cinema before the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated this change. So again, you know, technology, creativity, new forms, new formats. Um, I moved a bit away from your question. I mean, I think that it, there is a demand for newer, um, different stories in film as elsewhere. I think they've proved that in South Korea. That's why I mentioned, you know, the fact that um, uh, uh, Parasite, which is a quite a strange film, I don't know if you've seen <laughs> it. You know, I mean, but the fact that that became, uh, not only did it win an Oscar, it did uh, uh, attract an audience around the world is good news. I mean, from my point of view. Um, so, you know, it, it, we, we're living in a world of contradictory uh, uh, changes, I think. I'm interested that you work in a think tank. If you work in a think tank, you may understand some of these questions better than I do. <laughs> well, yes, it's a very, very good question. Um, and the answer is we have both. So, but that, that isn't surprising because our creative economy is, so, is huge and it's very big and it's, a lot of it is quite old. So the specific answer to your question is that there are trade representational, representative bodies or trade associations, we call them, for all of these component parts of the creative sector. So the music industry has a trade association, right? Actually, it has more than one. Um, the film and television industry has its own trade association. It's called the British Screen Forum. I'm a member of it. Um, the architects have their own trade association. The games industry has two trade associations, but they're different memberships. Um, one of them is, um, represents the interests of game designers, and the other represents the interests of games publishers. Right? They're different um, parts of the value chain. Uh, and so on, across the whole sector. So it's true of um, um, games, it's true of design, uh, it's true of music, it's true of theatre. All of these organisations have their own distinct trade association, and they only discuss music, or they only discuss design, they only discuss whatever it is. And then, Sitting above these organizations, you have really two organizations which cover the whole of the creative sector. And one of them is very like your association. I mean, the, the, your association of creative industries, we have an exact equivalent of. It's called Creative UK. And it represents, it has members across all of these industries. And actually not just companies, it also has individuals in membership as well. You pay a fee in the same way. Um, and that was originally created in 2014, so not that long ago. Um, and then it merged three years ago to become Creative UK. So we have one single lobbying association, just like this group of people. But we also have, you know, uh, uh, the siloed, the, the, the industry-specific trade associations. And the relationship between the two is not always comfortable. You know. 
because, um, you know, there are people in the film industry who say only people who work in the film industry can lobby the government about the film industry. We don't want those people in Creative UK doing it because they represent everybody else. You know, they, they represent... Um, uh, they represent musicians and theatre people and they don't know anything about film. So, <laughs> so there is a tension. Um, there's a tension between uh, specialist knowledge that comes from um, um, spending all of your time working in games or whatever it is, and the desire to bring together all of the creative um, uh, sections or subsectors, I should say, subsectors is the word, in order to represent to government, to lobby government um, in everybody's interests. Um, but uh, Nazgul, I cannot pretend to you that this is always harmonious. It's not. Uh, and, you know, there are people who've been working in the music business for 50 years who say, we know about the music business, you don't. <laughs> so, so, excuse me, we will represent ourselves, right? And that creates a certain amount of competition. So if that doesn't happen here in some form, I would be very surprised. But, um, but it's, it's much more likely to happen, you know, in a... a, a a, 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 a bigger kind of economic context. Yeah. Now the next question is a think tank. So we are among the only one who is thinking about this question. Uh, now, as I see it, this state of mind, also that you say. Ah, yes, I didn't really talk about that. Yes. Yeah. And also, I see that coding, commercial skills, technical skills. Yeah. It actually uh, advocacy for education. Like we're thinking that in a way you have to have human capital to do that. Yeah. You need creative people and in the top yeah. of the case, for example, yeah. base, you have to have a lot of people. Yeah. And is it possible that we can inform or move it this way that uh, such things require that you need like good educated people? Guy in the program, if you want to have like really advanced, because Korea have very advanced education. Yes. We're good at that. So it was easier for them to switch to that. My weak link saying it was anything like we can do that. Technology is being played in the internet is a core thing machine. We can yeah. really easy and fast go that. We don't have like uh, you say that for the developed countries it will be harder because maybe it's like building subway in country where you have all of the subway. You have to first uh, yes, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, is it possible to kind of like spotlight this idea that, guys, we can do that, but in order to do that, we need a few more resources, so let's put this on the digital system for education. Can yes. you add to what he was just said just now? Thank you, first of all, for the fascinating presentation, and as a fellow of both of the universities that we're talking about, local university here, I was wondering actually about the same skills, how actually we being in a higher education field mm. can add to like to my service or how can I actually because I have been positive in my students. Yes. So how can I actually improve mm. as okay. an educator? Yeah. There, there are two two questions here and thank you for uh, <laughs> so we got to the last slide, but I suddenly thought, ah, I've talked too much, so I won't address these points. But so let me come back to these, uh, both these points. Let me deal with the state of mind first. I apologize, I haven't um, addressed this. Dan will be interested in this. So um, even in the advanced creative economies like the UK, US, etc. We still have problems defining what we do, classifying what we do, communicating to government what it is, you know, exactly. Um, and 
the, where this phrase comes from is our mutual friend John Newbegin said to me, sometime, he said, Martin, sometime, I give up trying to define creative industries. Maybe it's actually about a state of mind. Is that, that's what John said. And I quite like this idea, you know, because I think it's something fairly powerful. It is about a state of mind. Uh, and and it, it goes back to what I was trying to say about right collective mindset, you know. But uh, the separate point, and both of your questions, skills. Now, I think this is really, really quite interesting. Um, and, well, very interesting, and also a very difficult challenge. Um, in the UK, we are desperately short of skills in all creative subsectors. Desperately short. We're short of film technicians. We're short of video games technicians. We're short of production accountants. I mean, we, it, it's, it, in every one of these industries, the really skilled people we don't have enough of. And we are, a de we are developed. I mean, we, we've been doing this stuff for years, and we've got, uh, we've got training programs, uh, we've got university departments. We still cannot produce enough skilled people. And um, it's one of the questions that our government is investigating at the moment. I mean, it's why can't we find enough people? Um, and it's because we don't, we have never given a proper priority to the development of skills. I mean, as, as, a, uh, uh, um, as a form of uh, educational activity. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me that um, <laughs> on two occasions, um, I've been to this part of the world, I mean, um, once in Aomati and, and once in uh, Toshkent, and um, somebody has come and said to me, <laughs> Martin, we are very, very short of cameramen in this country. Can you find somebody in England who can come and train cameramen in, in Uzbekistan? And I, I always say the same thing. I say. I'm, I'm afraid we're also short of cameramen in the UK. And if there is anybody who's really good at training cameramen, they are very expensive, you know. Uh, it, it's interesting how um, it, it virtually no country has successfully understood how you do this kind of skills development. Now, what it, of course, it depends what you mean by, by skills. So we immediately have to distinguish between different levels of, of skills. And some are very practical, or we would call them vocational skills. They are technician skills. So uh, let me be clear. I want to distinguish between, I think, um, at least four different kinds of skills. Um, there are technical skills of the sort that I am uh, just alluded to. So, you know, um, cameramen, uh, sound uh, technicians, uh, all the kinds of specialist uh, people you need to make a movie or made, make a television program or to run a pop concert. I mean, to do a, to do a rock concert. You know, the technicians who work on those gigs are very, very specialists and very qualified and very skilled. But they, they don't learn in university. I mean, they learn on the job. They have apprenticeships, you know. And, but those are vocational skills, so that's one kind of skill. There is another skill which I would call cultural management skills. And that's of less relevance to most people but it, it, it teaches you how to run a museum or how to run a theater, you know, or how to run another kind of uh, public uh, sector, usually public sector, arts organization. Those are more formal skills 
And by the way, we teach them at, at Goldsmith. We have, we have postgraduate degrees. People come to learn about cultural management. Postgraduate, these are MA courses. They last two years. And so it's not for undergrad, it's not first degree, it's second degree. But these are, um, uh, these are degrees where you may have what we call a pathway in music or fashion or television or games or film. So you learn general management, but also specific uh, skills in relation to. So that, that's called, what I call that um, cultural management skills. There are creative skills in, in the third category. That, that's easy to understand. You know, you train to become a potter. You train to become a, a, a sculptor. You know, you, you do that in a traditional art school or musician in a conservatoire. Um, but the newest, of course, the newest category of skills, which you certainly know about here, um, I keep on seeing on my LinkedIn feed, Dina, is it uh, Codify? Um, is, is, is that the name of her company? So coding skills. I mean, coding skills increasingly are uh, required in the creative sector in all kinds of creative enterprises. And we're not very good at teaching those in the UK. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are countries that are better than, than we are. But it, it, these are four different, four different kinds of skills. Cultural management, digital coding skills, uh, technical skills, sound, lighting, etc., and creative skills. And you need different kinds of pedagogy. You need different kind of training approaches. But above all, you need investment. I mean, if you're teaching uh, any one of these skills in a university, you have to be paid to do it. And who is going to pay you to do it if the state doesn't do it? The private sector doesn't pay for this stuff. Not usually, you know. Actually, in the UK, we have begun to persuade some private sector uh, um, companies in the audiovisual sector to make a contribution to the skills development. Um, and you can see it in particular at our national, we have, we have something called the National Film and Television School, right? Um, which is where you learn to, do, uh, to be a sound technician or a cameraman. Uh, or, you, or you learn um, how to do uh, the marketing for a film. Uh, um, and the money to run this school, half of it comes from the government. But now the other half comes from the BBC, ITV, Amazon, Netflix. In other words, it comes from the private sector. Because they know that if, if this organization doesn't train these young people, there won't be enough people coming into their businesses to make their businesses profitable. You know? um, but, but the private sector generally has not been very good at, um, at investing in skills. It, it's, it's the public sector that carries the burden. And, and I mean, I, I don't know what the situation here is. Um, but many of the people doing this teaching uh, in universities and in colleges are not very well paid either. That's another thing. But maybe we should uh, <laughs> maybe we'd have a separate conversation about that. But it, but your both of these general questions are very good questions, and I have to say we have not really been brilliant at, at, at answering them. Um, and um, uh, we, we need to find better ways of training people. And here, of course, technology does uh, provide part of the answer in the sense that we ha increasingly have something called blended learning. I mean, I don't know whether you use that phrase, blended learning for some university courses now. It, 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 we had to do it in the pandemic because 
because students could not go to lectures. So um, very, very quickly, we were forced to put some of our lectures uh, uh, um, online. I, I remember myself giving a lecture to New York University to 140 students on Zoom. And I hated every minute of it because I couldn't see, I, you know, here I can talk to you, I can see your face, you know, we can have a discussion. You've got 120 people on Zoom in New York. It's hopeless, you know. You can just give them your lecture. You can't have any interaction. But now, so we learned some things from that experience. Now we're using more what we call blended learning, so a combination of online and face-to-face. Um, but, I, I mean, actually, the, the real answer is that all the training that we're doing in our country, we need to multiply by five, I would say. Multiply by five. And the question is, who's going to pay for that? You, know, you don't have to answer. I mean, it, it's, it's, I, mean, it, it's, uh, I mean, our government isn't going to pay for it because they want to cut expenditure. Actually, they need to increase expenditure on this activity. I'm being very controversial. I might get into trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, and I, you know, I've me I mentioned it at the World Creative Economy Conference in Dubai. So, I mean, sorry, I mean, that's a slightly jokey response, but the, the serious... The, the serious response is, uh, and you know, Daniel and I have talked about this many times. Um, I think that what is being developed here is a distinctive model. I think it's a different model from the model which you find in most other countries. And um, I mean, and I'm learning myself. I mean, not, not I mean, learning. Uh, not just by coming here, but, but by visiting other countries as well. Uh, I'm learning that there are very different paths. There are different models. And there are different trajectories of growth and development. And I think it's very foolish to suggest that what works in country A can be translated into country B and expect it to have the same effect. Now, this is, I think this is a genuinely interesting uh, discussion because I do not mean by that that you cannot learn from the experience of other countries or international comparisons are interesting. And so, um, and you, you learn uh, from what other countries are trying to do and how they're trying to do it. So, you know, to give you an example, I mean, I said I was in Dubai in, in, in uh, December. So when I was there, I learned that the, the government there is uh, in the process of um, implementing a three-year plan, right? And their plan is to um, increase the percentage of um, gross domestic product um, contributed by the creative sector from 3% to 5% over a period of, I think it's three years. Three years, yeah. three years yeah. That's the objective they've set themselves. Ah, um, whether they will achieve it is a different matter, but, but they've set themselves a very public target, you know. Um, and it will be interesting to see whether they achieve it or not. But whether they do achieve it or they don't achieve it will not hold many lessons for Kyrgyzstan, for example, because Dubai is not the same as Kyrgyzstan. What works in Dubai wouldn't necessarily work here and vice versa. You, you, uh, the two countries have different strengths. And Dubai, for a start, has loads of banks, you know, I mean, hundreds of banks. 
and they put loads of money into art galleries. I mean, art galleries are a big, big thing in Dubai, and, and, uh, and there's a lot of private money that goes in, in, into those places. So um, I, what I'm saying is that I think you need to draw a balance between recognizing and accepting that there are things to be learned by, uh, by studying the examples of other countries. But you have to draw insights from them. You don't, um, uh, you don't have to, and you should not imagine that what works in one country can be translated into another. Now, what I think I understand to be happening here is distinctive. And I've, I've described it before, but you know, let me have another attempt. I mean, the... the I think the driver of growth here is places like this. I call them managed workspaces with a genius creative twist. That's, that's my definition of, um, of this place. It's a managed workspace. But there are lots of managed workspaces, by the way, all around the world. I mean, you can't. There is this huge American company called we Spe uh, WeWork, you know, which does the same thing. But they're boring places. I mean, they're, you know, they, 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 I mean, let's just look at this room. I mean, it's just brilliantly conceived. It, 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 it is itself an expression of creativity, and that is an important part of the model. It's what attracts people to come here. Um, so the model here is it's, it's developed from within the private sector, but now with an expression of government support. I mean, that's what the law, the creative law. But. So I think this is a unique model. I mean, I haven't seen a model which is quite the same. So to answer your question, yes, I do think it's possible that in five years' time, some very clever young person in Oxford University will write a doctoral thesis, and the title will be The Kyrgyz Model of Creative Development. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's the last question, yeah. I think, for today. It, it's a paradox, and um, I, I'm, I'm very conscious of the uh, um, risk of using this uh, title. It's a provocation. The title, Death of the Artist, is a provocation. And you have to read the book to understand in the way in which it is a provocation. He's not saying that artists are going to die. I mean, this is, that would be crazy, you know. They're not going to die. What he's saying is that it's harder for artists in the modern world to make a living a professional living in a world in which we are told that anybody can be an artist. So this is the Silicon Valley mantra, you know. Anybody can be an artist. Write a song, get your guitar, you know, play your song, record your song, put it up on YouTube, and you'll make lots of money. It's rubbish. You know, it's complete rubbish. Uh, um, uh, there are thousands and thousands of music acts, you know, rock bands, hillbilly bands, hip-hop bands, who put stuff up on YouTube, and they never sell a record, not one. <laughs> so it, it, he, he is he's talking about the death of the artist. In, he's using it as a, as a provocation. But the real answer to your question is, and it goes to the heart of what I've been trying to talk about in, in, in you know, art and technology, the relationship, is there is a paradox here, which it, it is true, you know, that more people now than ever have the tools because technology provides the tools to be uh, expressive, to express themselves, to express their creativity. Uh, and that's great. It's fantastic. I mean, everybody can do it. Um, it doesn't mean to say that everybody can find a market for that work. Uh, 
but I, I think that just to, this is the closing point. I mean, there is some sense, of course, in which this is not new at all. There have always been far more painters, you know, in the, than there have been people who can sell their work for large sums of money. You know. uh, um, lots of people are amateurs, amateur painters. They do it because they love it. They might sell a picture for, you know, 50 som or 100 som or, or 10 billion som. It doesn't matter to them. What matters is that they create. <coughs> so in that sense, we are in a period in which it is the opposite of the death of the art. It's the life of the artist, you know. But it's in the commercial sense that it's, it's, more, it's more difficult, more professionally more difficult, I think. So <coughs> it's a parad <coughs> I think it's a paradoxical reality. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and, uh... Thank you. Thank you. And good luck. And thank you. In that paper uh, that uh, Martin addressed to the, to the parliament, he shared with us, and he says that uh, he was studying uh, the cases of Slovenia and Kyrgyzstan, and he says that uh, Great Britain has something to learn from them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, yeah, it's in, yes. it's uh, it's like watching Avatar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's the uh, same kind, same level of fantastic. Yeah, will will be so successful. But uh, if we try one hundred technologies, two yes, of them, yes, yes. two of them will work, yeah. and that might be enough for a country yeah. of our size. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.